Today's work session to order now, and it is Thursday, February 16th, and I am Sherry Weiner, Fair Board Chair, and I am happy to welcome you. I'm going to go ahead and ask for an approval of the February 9th work session minutes. No. Mm -mm. Yes. So okay, he said so moved. Is there a second for his so moved? A uh, second. Commissioner Avila seconds. Okay. Has everybody had a chance to review those? Because I know you got them earlier today. Okay. All in favor, Commissioner Owens. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Hartley. Aye. Commissioner Avila. Aye. And I am an I as well, so they pass. I would now like to call on Commissioner Hartley to make a statement. Thank you. Uh, as I've mentioned many times, I have a uh, unfortunate professional disposition as a, a lawyer, so I always overthink things. And one thing I thought about was that I have a, I don't think it's a conflict of interest, but it's a potential conflict of interest. So I wanted to make sure everybody heard this. Um, I have another business called Nashville Clubs LLC that provides after school uh, programs to children. And we are, my company is, 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 which is just me, it's one person, is um, considering renting the SNAP Community Center for doing after school programs. Um, I don't think SNAP's not a part of this deal, but they have signed a letter in opposition to the deal. So I just wanted to disclose that for everyone so you'd be aware of it. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I see none. Okay, I am going to now provide a quick moment of privilege for our director, Womack. Um, obviously, we've had a lot of meetings lately, and I just really wanted to acknowledge Christy because she has gone above and beyond to get these meeting minutes. She not only sits through these meetings, she goes through the recordings multiple times to do the minutes and to turn them around this quickly. I just wanted to acknowledge her and thank her for all that work because it is extremely time consuming and she's so detailed and diligent um, and we really appreciate it. You've heard the saying, it takes a village. Christy is a village in and of herself. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, we are now going to rearrange this order just a little bit for conciseness and, and efficiency. Um, we wanted to discuss, related to the draft documents, um, a review and discussion of any of the outstanding questions or items. I'm gonna move that a little bit later in our conversation um, where we can also talk about some of the amendments and the document that was sent to you today in Excel format that puts everything together. Um, so I think we're gonna move this up to um, review the operating lease first. So I am going to ask you to grab your operating lease. And see, I wanna see if anybody has any questions or comments in general about the operating lease or any specifics within that document. And if you don't, we'll move on. I mean, I've submitted a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. We just do those when we get to them. Yes. I don't have any outside of that. Okay. So. It was on the agenda, so I wanted to make sure we at least had the opportunity first. Commissioner Alvaro, do you have anything? No. Commissioner Owens? No. Made that easy. Let's move on. Bear with me a minute. Okay. So we have the amendments and Laura put them in categorical order. Um, and I want us to be able to address the topics and hear from Tom as to the impact of any of the changes that'll guide us in our deliberation and our consideration of this. And I'm gonna share that the amendments um, have already been shared with Bristol and Metro Legal yesterday, and they are being discussed. In fact, several were already discussed. Um, we're gonna go over the amendment procedure again, 
and hear generally from Tom today about things that should guide that discussion, as well as um, the impacts of making changes to the pro forma, some of the financing. And I had the opportunity to um, visit with several neighbors today. Um, and it, they were quite lengthy conversations and they were, they were really good um, and informative. And I sent a couple of the questions um, to Tom and um, he is going to, I thought it was important that he share his thoughts about um, where we're going from this point forward, as well as some of the comments that were provided to me. Um, I want him to cover that now. Tom. Okay, I'm, we'll try to remember all of those, but may need a reminder from you. But let, okay. let me, if I can, take the last one first. And the question that you had posed to me earlier this afternoon had to do with what might happen if the fair board or the council uh, declined to approve this deal. And in, in my view, though, there's a, there's a court of appeals uh, decision pending on some litigation that bears on, on what happens on the fairgrounds and uh, the private development in soccer. I, I, don't, I don't think it bears on this specific question. And I think the answer to it is, if the deal it doesn't pass, then of course council is going to have to honor the requirement in the charter that auto racing and other activities continue as they were in 2010. And I, in my view, that requires a, a standard of maintenance on the existing facility such that those activities can be conducted safely and in an ADA compliant way. And I think that is at least part of the focus on the, of the facility condition assessment that has been requested and I know your last work session touched on. So council's gonna have to have to fund what is necessary to keep facilities in a, in a condition such that those activities can take place. For most of the activities that are specifically listed in the charter, it isn't an issue. For example, the, um, the flea market, there's, there's space in the expo buildings and in the concourse of, the, of this building and elsewhere on the campus to conduct the flea market, which has been done successfully ever since Geodis opened. Um, for the state fair, we, part of the court case that's pending at the Court of Appeals, um, the, the net the conclusion was there is space here to conduct a fair that the, that the charter requires. And for auto racing, obviously we have a facility that's got, that's got some needs. We have auto racing going on, but uh, I think the consensus among uh, people who know better than I is that there are improvements that need to be made to, to make it safe for both racers and patrons and for the ADA compliance as well. Does right. anybody have any questions for Tom at this point? Commissioner Hartley. That's very helpful. So, and I, I agree with your analysis completely. Uh, Mr. Cross, um, is do we feel that we would be bound by particularly the assessment we just received, or how would we determine what is a safe and ADA compliant facility? And the reason I ask is a lot of my questions about that particular assessment was that it seemed in some places, as as you know, Commissioner Owens pointed out, in some places they were the two there were, there were some deficiencies we found in the the uh, report. It, it didn't seem to have two equal sets of requirements, et cetera. And it didn't always seem to be giving us an answer that was just a safe and AD compliant facility. So would we be bound by that? Or what, how would we determine what um, improvements were necessary, if not that? That's, that's just one data point, and you're not bound to the conclusions of the study. The, the board, if, 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 if for whatever reason this board or the council were to decline to approve the Bristol proposal, um, I think you're going to want some sort of a study done. If you don't like that one, you could commission one on your own, or you could ask the general services or some other metro department do it to determine what things are necessary at a minimum to make the facility safe and ADA compliant. There, there are plenty of things that I'm sure would be nice to have. And some of those are listed in the facility condition assessment that, that you received. Um, but for example, just to take one that I know was in the 2016 study that Laura mentioned uh, a couple of meetings ago, um, is, has to do with lighting. Lighting is really expensive. The charter doesn't require that night racing be part of the calculus. Is it nice to have? Sure. Any 
Any other questions? I have one other one. Okay, oh. go ahead. Yes. Um, if this board declines the Bristol proposal, does the council have the authority to still approve it? I'm not completely prepared to answer that question today. The, the fair board has a, a somewhat unusual powers under the charter that no ordinary Metro department has. The council's in complete control of most things having to do with Metro, but the fair board has, has some unusual powers and it, and it could be that if the fair board were to decline this proposal, the, the council couldn't overrule you on that. I think as a practical matter, if you were to decline it, the council would be very unlikely to overrule you e even so. Mr. Cross, and this is just for my information more generally about how the fair board's decision-making powers operate. I think I understand in our legal notice, we always say if you're not satisfied with the opinion of the fair board, you can appeal it to, I think the, the circuit or the district court. I'm not sure which court. I'm, I practice in federal court. I don't know anything about state court. Um, could you explain what the public's options would be in that situation or what would happen? The, the, what is referenced in the notice that, that's read at the beginning of every meeting um, under Tennessee law, you can appeal the decision of a board or commissioner or frankly, even a, an individual decision maker under some circumstances under so-called writ of certiorari if what the board or commission or person was doing was kind of acting in a, as a tribunal in a way, sort of applying law to a set of facts. It happens more commonly with the BZA or the planning commission where they're hearing a set of facts and applying the Metro code or some state law to it. And so in that procedure, the, 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 the plaintiff, the petitioner asks the court to reach down and take the record from the, the board or commission and determine whether they had a sufficient amount of evidence in the record to support the decision. They don't reweigh the evidence, but just sort of determine whether they followed the, the correct practice. Could that happen here? It's conceivable, but it's, it's fairly unlikely unless you just went completely off the rails. This, this is not one where you're, where you're, you're making the, that kind of a determination. Mr. Cooper. As a point of clarification, the only reason that notice is read is because the council passed an ordinance requiring that to be read for all boards and commissions, whether it applies to them or not. Just to, I, I completely agree both with your comment, Mr. Cooper and Mr. Cross. I mean, I don't think this, I mean, I'm just a, I'm not anybody's lawyer here, but it doesn't seem like we're deliberating on a point of law here. This is a complete business decision. I don't, I can't imagine anyone would go over the top of us in a, from a court, so. Just if I, if I may, Madam Chair, I, I cannot recall a long career here that anybody has ever sued Metro for not entering into a contract. Does anybody else have any other questions for Mr. Cross at this point? Okay, do you wanna move on to the next one? Point number two, and maybe point of order first. I thought we were going with first names here, so if I get that wrong. Oh, we can do that. <laughs> Go for it. Usually, Mr. Cross means uh, deep trouble. Um, so the, one of the other questions had to do with uh, potential amendments that board members have requested or recommended or, or at least raised that have an effect on the pro forma that applies to the deal. Um, there are changes that you might request that improve the deal for Metro so that the net is more revenue coming in. Those things would also improve conceivably the debt service coverage ratio and more money in the waterfall is generally better for Metro across the board. But if you're proposing changes that would have the effect of decreasing the amount of money coming in, it's gonna have an effect on our ability to repay the bonds and it could be that we couldn't even sell bonds if the ratio got completely out of whack. Now, I should also add that, that there's gonna be no change to a financial term, of course, that Bristol doesn't agree to, and I'm sure everybody realizes that. So changes that result in more revenue coming in, generally good, might not get Bristol to agree to it. Changes that result in less money coming in, probably bad. Bristol probably fine with that. And I'll just add, I mean, I won't speak for the other commissioners. I know I've sent in some suggested amendments for us to consider. 
I don't believe any of mine would impact the pro forma, but if, if we disagree, I'll talk to you after Tom and we can kind of talk about that. I think most of mine are non-monetary terms. Anybody have any other questions for Tom at this point? All righty. Continue, please, uh, sir. The third thing that I had listed from our earlier conversation, and I, I may be one short here, just had to do with the general legality of the things that had been suggested as potential amendments. And I, I have watched them coming in, and I've, I've looked back through my list uh, this afternoon. I don't see anything that we just, we simply couldn't do as a, as a violation of state law or the charter or some metro code section. So I think the things that have been proposed are things we could probably figure out a way to do as long as Bristol was willing to agree to it. And um, impact on Nashville soccer. And this one, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that uh, I understand the question, but but here, let, let me uh, respond as I, as I do understand it and consistent with the conversation we had earlier. Nashville soccer's deal is completely separate from, from this one. And occasionally um, we hear questions from board members or members of the audience at your regular meetings, uh, sort of questioning why provisions in the deal that we're, that we're considering now, or you're considering now, aren't the same as those in the national SC deal. And it's, as, it's, as is obvious to everybody, if you, if you get there first, it's gonna change the playing field for everybody who comes after you. It's like being a developer who's the first in some area. You may, you may wind up with some, some favorable attributes to your development that subsequent developers are just not gonna get. Well, here, the, the deal that a previous fair board and a previous council entered into with National SC has some terms and provisions in it that I'm sure uh, Bristol would, would love to have. And one of the things that they've mentioned is, I often have that effect. <laughs> Not bad. All right. But our microphones still work. <laughs> so, so one of the things that has been mentioned is um, the 10 acre development tracks that uh, one, of, one of them is, is being developed at the moment. And of course, that is a, is a completely different financial arrangement than, than has been proposed for Bristol. In the National SC deal, the, the team has committed that all that, that revenues will be sufficient to cover debt service. And at least one of the questions that I know you've gotten from the audience has, has, been, has been suggested a time or two is, why isn't Bristol cutting that same deal? And Bristol's response to that has been, because we don't have that development parcel to work with. So it's, it's sort of a bitter and sweet kind of a arrangement here. There are some things that are more favorable, favorable for Bristol, I would say, than in the National SC deal. And there's some things in the National SC deal that are more favorable than, than what is proposed in the Bristol deal. So they're totally separate and you shouldn't feel that you are bound to equalize them somehow. This is just, this is just a different deal. So it's, it's fine to think about things like curfews and noise limitations and whether, whether it's the right thing to do to, to apply the same rules across the board, but it's, it's completely different to think about whether the, some financial term ought to be exactly the same in this deal as in another deal, because the, the playing field has just changed. And then lastly, um, you were going to address any of the amendments that seek to change the existing contract with soccer. Uh, yeah, that's, that's we, we can't impose a change on an existing contract, <clears throat> NSC deal included. If NSC is interested in amending that contract for whatever reason, presumably because they're getting a concession on something that they would like to have, that's fine. We can always talk to them about their willingness to do so. But we, we cannot impose on them a change to their deal to make some other deal work better or to facilitate entry into that deal. Anybody have any questions or additional comments about any of that? Okay, moving on. Um, I had mentioned earlier, and you've seen, I hope, the documents that um, Laura sent over in the Excel packet that has pretty much ev what has everything that we have reviewed to date, the questions, um, and pretty well encapsulates all the information, distills it into one, one document to make it easier for us to review. So hats off to Laura because I was going to help her with this and I didn't get a chance because she'd already done it. So thank you. 
it was it was a big lift, y'all. What what she's put together. Um, the amendments that are they still in there? Or did you take them out? I took them out. Okay. So um, the amendments, once we agree and once we present them, they will be part of the new proposal that we will look at as amended. And um, we won't necessarily put all the amendments out there, um, but we will discuss them here today. Okay. Um, so, Laura, do you want to go through the amendment categories? I can. And I also wanted just to let you know that um, I did put draft on all of these. I do have some edits that were sent over that I just didn't get a chance to update. I will update those on your versions and get it out to you, but please consider this a working document because I do think it's going to evolve over the next couple weeks. Um, want to make sure that you have the most um, up-to-date and relevant information in front of you. So I will be for sure making at least three updates. I, one of them, I know I used um, old numbers and not new numbers. So I'll get that all changed um, and get those redlined out to you so you can see where the changes were. Um, most of this information that's contained is already in the, on the website for the public. All I did was t took everything and kind of organized it, you know, so that it was easier to digest. But um, as far as the amendment requests, what we've done is uh, put them in a big list and then kind of identified a topic that the amendment addresses. And so I just wanted to go over those with the groups and the public so that they, everybody understands kind of the main categories of what we're talking about here. Get my glasses on. So. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Laura. Sure. I apologize. Uh, I don't apologize. I appreciate, I appreciate everything you do. I Thank just want you. to say that first of all. So what are we driving towards? Are we driving towards we're going to list them out? I mean, are we seeking, and this may be for Sherry, like are we seeking a collective uh, package to send over, further negotiate, and then come back with definitive documents? Or are we s just reading about today, thinking about, I mean, I just want to know what our job is as we listen, just to make sure we listen in the right way. I know a lot of the amendments are mine, guys. Let's just be honest. I know a lot of the amendments are mine, but I would like to know how I should evaluate the other commissioner's amendments as we're going through them. I think what we need to do, because we've already shared the amendments with everybody um, on both the administration side and on Bristol side, um, I think it's important for us to today look at the amendments and have an open conversation about what each one represents and the pros and the cons. We've got legal here to offer us insight. Um, we actually have Bristol and administration here to offer us insight. And I think that as we distill this down, it's better if we hear from everybody um, in this forum and that way we can sit here and openly discuss it. Um, we'll be better placed um, to understand where it can go moving forward. And then once we sit down and vote on the amendments, they're gonna be within the actual document so that we'll see what's been accepted because right now everything's been sent in and we had talked about voting on the actual amendments that we're going to move forward. Um, and because we went ahead to expedite this and shared it with them, um, this is an opportunity for us to be able to, to move that forward a little bit. So, no, that's, that's great. So I think I understand essentially we've sent to the parties, everyone's sort of amendments they would like to see in the deal. They're negotiating or deciding what they can agree to. But we're sort of today sharing that for information with everyone so that when they come back to us, everyone will be primed to know what they're looking at as far as the, the red lines that we get back. Yeah, it, this is an opportunity, like we said earlier, that we want to have this open dialogue and we want to talk about um, what the options are. You guys, the fair board authorized the director and myself to quote unquote negotiate or be involved in negotiating the deal, which we've done. Um, we felt like it was important for us to get a comprehensive document in front of us to vote on um, that we could either live or not live with, um, that we needed to be able to offer the opportunity for these amendments in a timely manner so that at the end of 
this process the day before it's time to vote, we don't have somebody coming in and saying, oh, I've got another amendment. Um, that's not efficient. And, and that's not fair to anybody. Um, and so that's why, you know, we have to find a way to structure it. And this just seemed like the most fair way for everybody to structure it so everybody has a chance to, to opine. And I think it's fair to say, too, we do know that there's really important documents that are outstanding yet that may address some of your concerns <laughs> in the amendments. So right. with that understanding, um, I'll go through the categories first. And then if we want to take them by category, I think that may be a good way to do it so that we're not hopping all over the place and we can be um, somewhat organized in our discussion. So main categories, we have um, access for fairgrounds, campus scheduling, the community, curfew, CVC operations and revenue, development oversight, food and beverage, fair board approvals, insurance, local racing, operational oversight, parking revenue, penalties, race scheduling, sound mitigation, it's very long, term language, termination, and traffic and management plan, and use overall use of the fairgrounds. So I suggest that we do this by category, and you've got them in front of you, and we'll just start at the top and work down. You don't have it in front of you. I would just hate to, you know, I mean, this is a important inflection. I, I just think it's probably good to have it in front of us. We're going to take a five minute recess so that we can get that document to everybody. In the same place as far as what's been requested. And, um, We'll just start. Let's look at alphabetically access for the fairgrounds. We have three entries in that area. So let's just give it a minute for you to take a look at it. And then we will entertain any questions or comments. I'm going to open this with a question on number three. Is there, and I don't know whose it is, but is there a particular reason that we need to have five fair board meetings on the facility concourse instead of where we typically have our meetings? Anybody? I mean, do you guys have an issue with that? I don't, I'm not sure I see the point in it. One way or the other, unless we, uh, like this, we're here because we reached out and asked because expos were all booked and we're loading in. And so maybe as needed, you know, a cooperative arrangement of some sort and put that language in there, you know, as a PRN. Just to make sure I understand, I, I think you're, all that points are well taken. I don't know that this is something that matters to me. It's not, I didn't propose this, but we are just, is this just going over for information the parties are discussing? Mm -hmm. So we're not like striking things out or anything, mm -hmm. right? You're just sort of having discussion about mm -hmm. it. Okay, thank you. I think this is just similar to, um, and, and it goes into the actual, another category of community access to the space. 
Okay. Anybody else have anything you want to add about this? Questions or anything? Okay. Um, let's move on to campus scheduling and the community because those all kind of bleed into each other. Just to remind everyone, we're very close at getting the scheduling document that is going to be part of the discussion. So we'll get that out to you as soon as it is, it is finalized. So I think that may answer some of the questions that mm -hmm. are pending regarding scheduling. Just because it's on my mind and it has nothing to do with the, the, this contract, but I think from a, from a community perspective, and I didn't um, ask for this either, but I think they, what we did brings up a good point. I think at some point we should be thoughtful about the consistency of the location, especially for the community, for the fair boards, just so that they don't have to be constantly trying to figure out where to go, how to access buildings. And so just in general, I think as a, as a board, we should try to be as consistent as possible so that the community knows where we're meeting. That's it. Anybody have anything they want to add about this particular segment? And again, like Laura said, some of that will already be wrapped into this. Okay. What it has down here, make speed for community events. Uh, is that meaning at no cost or at cost? So this was one of my amendments or proposed amendments. I think my idea, Anthony, is like, I mean, I'm open to market rent if Bristol really feels they need it. I don't really think this is going to be much cost to them at all. And I think the goal is to show, as you know, Mr. Caldwell and others have said, that they really want to be a partner. And this is just an opportunity to put that on paper, that they're going to be a partner and you know, support the work that Matthew's doing in the community, make space for community to be in, be in the building. It's similar to a lot of other public facilities where you know, they won't have anything happening in you know, meeting room B. And so they can say, well, you know, Casa Azafran, you can have your fundraiser meeting room B. That's my idea. Okay, so let so basically all of these fall all of these fall straight in line. Greenway space and bikes and runners and Yeah. I mean I think for me it's like, you know, this is still a a public uh a public uh amenity, the fairgrounds, you know, mm -hmm. it's for the public. So and a lot of what Jasper said at the last meeting about parking kind of flows through here too. It's like I mean, obviously, Bristol needs to run a business. They need to make enough money. We're not going to touch the pro forma here. But within that, if there's room for Bristol to demonstrate and make part of the campus available when it's not impacting them, I think it's a good idea. So I guess that makes me want to ask a question because I know that um, in the case of soccer, um, we can't access their field or interior when they're not in session because of upkeep and maintenance of the field. I don't know in terms of so, in terms of racing if that's going to be a protected space when they're not racing. And so I think that we probably would serve us to hear from them to know if this is going to be contrary to something that they would be able to consider um, for logistical purposes. I mean, I, I just don't know. That's the only reason I brought it up because I don't see, I mean, it depends on what space we're talking about. Like mm -hmm. we're talking about the track or the infield. Those seem like most facilities that are not open to the public, regardless of who's owners or whatever. But right. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously we wouldn't want to. We're not obligating Bristol to do anything that's going to damage their facility or again impact their ability to make revenue. It would be within, you know, a use that's not impactful. Um, I would also say I think. It, it, the track is currently open. You you can go in the track whenever you want. So I'd also think, you know, there's being able to kind of show that through line in the community is good, but certainly nothing that would be a damaging use. And I do want to say, though, you know, I just, and I know you're not doing this. This is not what you're doing, Cherry, but I just don't want this to creep into our thinking. As Tom pointed out to us, like, different deal in soccer. So obviously, I would love to have access to the soccer field, but we can't redo that deal. So I think we should just look for the opportunities here. And just because we maybe had, you know, a weak point in the soccer deal, there's no reason not to shore it up here. So if we can make it where, and assuming looking at the Bristol guys, if it's something that works in their business model and it's a, make it a better use for the community, then it's a, I think it's a win for everybody. 
Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, I also think about the Titans because I know we can't get on their field either. And so, you know, just for a com apples to apples kind of thing, I, I wanted us to, you know, at least think about that. And, um, you know, maybe it would be an opportunity for us to look at, you know, different parts of the property, but it's going to depend on, you know, what's feasible from their standpoint. Yeah, and in the... In the, in the the new uh, stadium deal, this is actually, that's where I got it from. It's yeah. the new stadium deal. It's, it's an aspect that the, the Titans have agreed to in the mm -hmm. new stadium deal. So I think that's where I carried it over from. We don't have to create the wheel when we can borrow it. <laughs> okay. Anything else in the community um, notices? I believe that Bristol is already, and y'all correct me if I'm wrong, haven't y'all already agreed to participate in NIAC meetings? Yeah, I thought that's already in there. Okay, let's move on to curfew. When we talk about curfew, we already have standing fairgrounds curfew rules um, that we actually had to apply with SC as it related to these concerts. Um, and so I want us to, you know, just keep that in mind that, that we do still have that authority that we have clearly exercised. Are you, are you saying that the idea being we can fall back on the campus rules as opposed to putting anything particular in the lease or just that we have both, we can do both? So for example, and you may want to speak to this because you handled it first, but... Um, with the pink concert, the Shania Twain concert. Yeah, so we have similar cur the curfews for like non um, racing, non soccer game events are very similar in how they're constructed in both documents as far as uh, 10, p 10 p.m. amplified music curfews, for instance. So when they when they asked us to extend the curfew, we said no. So there's that. With, I, I, go ahead, Mario. With the exception of uh, NASCAR races, right? One. And then, yeah. Right. What I mentioned was non-racing, non-soccer right. games. Right. Right. Well, and, and one point I do want to clarify, because it's in one of my other amendments, I think it's important, is, you know, the downside, and, and you're not saying this, Sherry, but it was it's sort of a both and, and the one of the half of the both is not going to work, is, you know, we can't rely on campus rules that are inconsistent with the lease because right now there's an out in the deal if there's a if there's a campus rule that material impacts Bristol's availability to operate then this overrides I mean I've got a great idea in here which I mean it's not my idea I didn't make it up but that's I think that's a fine provision but if our campus rules should be enforced on top uh, or sorry let me just start over I'm not making any sense what I'm ultimately getting at is we need to maintain our ability to have rules for the campus as long as they don't conflict with the operating lease. So I just want to put that out, make sure we have that in there, then I think relying on the campus rules is a great way to go. But if it's that we don't have that agreement from Bristol, then we need to think about putting everything into the lease. And curfew for Friday and Saturday is what time? 10 p.m.? Do what now? Every day. Oh, every day is 10 p.m.? Mm -hmm. Could we like on, adopt a notes. club model like they <laughs> or something? I would think Friday and Saturday would be different, but that's just me. Uh, that just like most establishments with curfews or closing times. Friday and Saturday get a little more extended. So, like for me, Friday and Saturday, like 11 o'clock would be great for me, but that's just me. We have Mario, had times where we have brought exceptions to the board for their consideration and they've granted them in special circumstances. So it's not unheard of that we do extend the um, curfews if needed. Mario, did you want to add something? No. I was just going to reiterate that that's the exception are the races. So we'll have 
there is there will be racing and or amplified sound during those 10 weekends or 10 racing days, right? And that curfew doesn't hold during those days. No, the curfews are set at 10 o'clock, um, uh, uh, scheduled to 10 o'clock, but knowing that there's could be going to 11, yeah. um, as far as amplification, you know, if you look at a race, it's some PA, um, you know, typically that's what we see is just announcements and, you know, over the PA. But if you look, it's, there is a lease, a, a curfew section in, in your documents. If you, if you look at activation, it really defines, um, and there is a correction to the activation section that I'll make, um, I believe on uh, weekends on on Friday, but for the most part, that is an accurate representation of what's in the lease. Thank you. What I mean, I think the direct question, Mario, is currently the lease reads with no limits on when you can end the NASCAR race or when you can end sound amplification at the NASCAR race. Is my reading? Um, I think I think that's the intent of the deal, and if it's not, um, John can tell us otherwise. But I think that the intent is there are no curfews for the NASCAR race right now. That I think my, there should be one. Okay. That was my understanding. That's why that was my understanding that that's what the that there is no limit on a curfew during NASCAR. John. So with the understanding that we can't bind NASCAR to anything through this lease, um, there's language in there about scheduling the races and having scheduling times to end to match the curfew, but we can't guarantee through this lease agreement that NASCAR would commit to that. Uh, I mean, other, outside of saying, here's the curfew, this is what is expected. Well, that's like saying you can't tell NASCAR anything. I mean, obviously you could provide that as a consideration when they, uh, when they award the race, um, just like you could, you could ask them to use mufflers, you could ask them anything. Obviously your point is that they are likely not to agree to that maybe, John, but you can certainly make that a condition of being awarded a race. I'm not involved in negotiating with NASCAR. Um, so I, I. Do what, what'd you say? Yes, please. So we can talk to NASCAR, we can work with them. They're, we're cooperative, we're partners in it, but we can't dictate terms and conditions to NASCAR because all they got to do is say, okay, we're not going to put the race there and then nothing works. So yes, I mean, we're going we're gonna to work with them. They understand where this is, how this is. They, they're, you know, they've been great about talking about things and being open to things. We just can't say with definitive, absolute, this is how it's going to be. No NASCAR, we're not going to put a race here because it could rain. Uh, but I haven't checked the schedule carefully, but I don't think it's too many NASCAR races that even go at that time. So currently going. You're right. So, yeah, so I, I don't think that's a... You're exactly right. They like prime time yes, television. I don't think that's the issue, but you know, and that's yeah, yeah. over well Correct. before ten or eleven o'clock usually. Yeah. Mario, do you have anything you wanted to add? Todd, Anthony. Uh, mm -mm. Sorry. Um, so let's let us. Do we have anything else in curfew? I'm going to take that as a no, and we'll move on to CVC operations. Tom, correct me if I misunderstand what I've been reading 
for months now, but CBC is held to the same standard as they are a tenant of Bristol. That's correct. They're a subtenant, or, or they will be, and they're, they're, the restrictions that apply to Bristol apply to them as well. I think my, I, that's a good point. And Tom and I discussed this before. And John, if you're, if you're cool with it, I just wanted to clarify, because if you look in section, this is super dry, by the way, thank you all for listening. 12F, there's a statement that says, uh, CVC shall retain all revenues from ticket sales for CVC events and the same shall in no event be included in gross revenue. And to me, that seems to indicate a different flowing of revenue. I just want to confirm, and as long as Metro Legal feels it's confirmed, I'm cool with it, that the, I mean, the intent, everybody agrees on the intent. I just want to clarify the language that it's flowing just like a regular Bristol day. So you're talking about the uh, food and beverage revenue split so the, the the way the the contract is written is language um revenue that comes to bristol from food and beverage and from th these other things the percentage flows through to the fair board so that would be the case whether they get that revenue through a cbc event or otherwise but if that revenue doesn't come to bristol then that wouldn't apply is the way I read it. I think that is the, the way it reads now. I guess when I'm reading ticket sales, I'm thinking about the sales tax revenue. There's no tinkering with the, the ticket tax, if that's what you mean. Oh, what I'm saying is, is when I read this, it seems to say that the CVC, it's a CVC ticket sales uh, are retained by are retained by CVC. I just want to make sure yeah, so the, that the sales tax part of the ticket sales still comes to Metro. The, the sales tax for all events is pledged or will be pledged. Right. So, yeah, they, yes, there's no way to avoid paying the sales tax on right. the ticketed events. And that was, was I promised y'all super dry, and I delivered. That's why we're going home. That's why we're doing this. Um, anybody have any other questions? in this area. Well, I might as well ask my other super dry question, which is you see the one about a mechanism for payment. Are you guys comfortable, Tom, that I mean, it says the fair board pays or causes C CVC to pay? Are you comfortable with that? It's in section. Uh, well, you could just look at it and decide if you're comfortable with it. Yes. Um, Bristol's re responsible for, we guess it's actually one of the, this question came up or a version of it came up in one of the previous work status meetings and it's really on Bristol to do it. There's another comment that you have here. I think this came out of yours about uh, su a successor entity. I think that's, that is something we want to make sure we address. Anybody have anything else on this section before I move on? All right, let's go to uh, development oversight. And in that, we'll include environmental oversight as the last one in that bucket. Tom and John, can you all speak to um, this notion that I read over and over again about the Speedway Oversight Committee as it relates to every time Metro is referenced in oversight, who that falls to. Is it going to fall to our designated contract overseer? Is it going to fall to that person and the community oversight? I mean, this um, Speedway Oversight is... Can you help clarify yeah, that? Yes, and we, we need to go through and make sure that we've got it uh, the way it should be. But there's some things that you, you want your construction monitor out there every day or certainly every couple of days to make sure that the construction work comports with the plans and specifications that you've approved. But to the extent that something needs, to, needs approval, a, a change of any kind, that needs to come, really needs to come either to the operate to the oversight committee or to the board and we're happy to work with you on on how you think that ought to land the advantage to having it 
at least some of the decision making, some of the approval power in the hands of the oversight committee is they can meet ad hoc in your board meetings are usually once a month and it's a sort of an imposition to have to meet really frequently and during the particularly during construction that might be necessary so well and is that not <clears throat> the purpose of the speedway oversight committee that's certainly one of the purposes so they can be a little bit more nimble and not monopolize the time of the entire board and as a comparison we had a very similar setup with the stadium and it worked really well because we were able to respond pretty quickly to change orders and such as they came up. So the overall, in, I, I wrote most of these. Uh, I mean, I think the overall intent is in the development phase, guys, what's important is that we maintain sufficient oversight. I think everybody gets that general point. We are working with Bristol. They're going to choose a design uh, builder. They're going to go and do the design. In some places, there is um, sort of weaker approval powers, and in other places there are stronger approval powers. And to me, I think we should increase the level of oversight generally. I don't necessarily, I, I've got listed here several places where I think it should be, for example, a decision that's of a greater magnitude should come to the fair board versus the smaller decision or the more nimble decision should be with the Speedway Oversight Committee. Uh, additionally, I think we should have wider latitude for how we make decisions. A lot of times, and these are kind of terms of art, but it seems like we are essentially expected to make to approve things unless things are unreasonable. And I think we should have a greater latitude. For example, choosing the, the choice of the design build contractor. Right now, we can only um, we can only and lawyers can debate about this, but we essentially can not approve the design build contractor that's selected only uh, if Essentially, we, we, we have a very weak approval right right now. I think we need a stronger approval right. That's a very important decision, and we should get to essentially have a strong choice in, in who, who the design build contractor is. So that's the overall thrust of these suggestions. Do you want to address that? That's more of a policy call, um, and it, I think it'd probably be helpful to let, let you know, or maybe maybe John could, where, where the process is in the selection of the design build contractor. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure that you, you entered into a contract and, and that one of the things that you do have approval rights over is the contract. So maybe you guys could update where that stands. A uh, competitive process using Metro's uh, model was done for the design builder just from a timing standpoint um, to go ahead and have that selected obviously the contract would have to be approved by the board um, but that process did just complete within the past days few days so that's a great example of, of what i'm getting at here so the main concern we have is this is a guaranteed maximum price deal which means if there is not enough money it is in bristol's interest to essentially and i don't think they would do that i'm not suggesting they would but we should have oversight what they could do is they could sort of cut corners in the construction. To, to the example John just gave, we do get to approve the design build contract and we have the authority to approve it, but such approval should not be unreasonably withheld, conditioned or delayed, which in legal terms means we have to approve it unless it's uh, unreasonable. So to me, what, what, we're, what we're agreeing, we're not supposed to be discussing these days, we're just, we're just putting these on the table. What we're agreeing to is relatively weak oversight of the, de, of the development phase. And if we're comfortable with that, we can comfortable with that. But to me, I would rather have more oversight of the development phase since that's where you're spending the $100 million. I think from, from Bristol's standpoint, the expertise that they bring in this area when it comes to building and renovating and operating tracks is part of what makes this deal work. And so I think that um, their experience in, in knowing how to oversee this type work should be considered. Um, we obviously agree that the fair board should have oversight and, and we're comfortable with that to some extent, but we can't, I mean, there, there has to be some balance. I, for one, have never built a raceway. I mean, I, w I wouldn't even, you know, purport to know. I was just going to offer, not exactly a correction, but just a clarification on how the process works from this point. 
Um, Br Bristol's not on the hook on the GMP. The, the, the process as envisioned in the way this works in um, construction management agreements and design build agreements, and I'm sorry to get into the weeds here, but they will go through a design process with the design builder and get the documents to a certain level of completion, usually between 75 and 95% complete. And then the design builder will give a GMP based on estimates that it's getting from, or sometimes signed contracts with subcontractors. And that, so then they give a, a GMP, proposed GMP to Bristol and to the fair board. Then we will know how much the money, how much the project is gonna cost overall. At about that time, Metro, we should know the interest rate that would be applicable to the bonds that Metro might issue for the project. We know the amount of the state grant. We know the amount of the, of the CVC grant that's left after the pre-construction activities are complete, com including design. And if there is a gap between the GMP and the sum of all those other revenue sources, then Bristol has a decision to make about whether it's in or not. But I just want to make sure that, it, you know, Bristol is not... At, at, that, at the point where you sign the GMP amendment with the, with the design bill contractor, they're on the hook for any overages. They're guaranteeing they're going to bring it in for that price or lower. That's true, but within the process of, of choosing and designing the design, there's plenty of room for sort of manipulation. I just want us to avoid, Gav, what we want to avoid is, is the, the public story that we're seeing with the Titans right now, which is that we had substandard construction, which led to a huge cost. So we don't want to repeat the mistake there that we're, we're having here. I have a lot of faith in Bristol, and I agree with you, John, that part of what they bring to the deal is expertise. I'm just asking for an oversight right. Again, Jerry's talked a lot about partnership. This is a great opportunity to show partnership where we don't expect to be blocking this. I mean, you've basically chosen the, the builder already, but it's an example of we should have those those pieces in our arsenal is what my point is. So one of the reasons that I was comfortable with the Speedway Oversight Committee is because that's a group of people that have the authority and hopefully the know-how and the knowledge and the time to dive into that, whereas, frankly, we don't. Well, and that's not the exact issue, Sherry. I, I agree with you. I'm very comfortable delegating some of the decisions to the Speedway Oversight Committee but there's also the level of discretion that the Speedway Oversight Committee has. Right now, in many provisions, you essentially have to approve unless it's unreasonable, which is a very narrow approval right. Gotcha. That's the point I'm getting at. Anybody want to address that? Anybody have any other questions or concerns? Do you want to talk about any of your other amendments in that area? Do you want to get dive into that a little bit more in terms of where you saw the specific concerns insofar as, you know, the weakness in terms of our authority? I was just looking looking through the list here. I mean the only ones okay, that's cool. the only one I'd point out, another good example of the same point, guys, is like if we get to and, and Tom's probably gonna correct me, I might get the details a little bit wrong, but if we get to a sort of a final set of design plans and then something in the construction requires a significant change in the design plans. Uh, and, and do double check me on this, John and Tom. I understand that there's an attempt to bring those design plans back, but if ultimately we cannot work the changed plans within the, the guaranteed maximum price, Bristol only has to at least fulfill the minimum design standards. So the point there is, I think we should get that second approval right if you come back and the plans change in the same sense. Like, I don't, I don't believe that would happen, but again, I, I don't operate on belief, operate on certainty. So I think it'd be better for us to have, a, again, a, an approval. If the plans are going to change, it makes sense for us to approve them again. That's just another example of the same point. Throughout here, there's also just some points where I'm asking for more reporting, which I think is good, as we learned in our last public meeting when oh, Jasper pointed out that soccer has not given us an overview of the season. I think a strong reporting mechanism as we hear from our Fair Park Phase 2, I think that's something good to have in here, just things like that. I think these are mostly relatively non-deal-breaking kind of points, but they're also things that are valuable and in the spirit of partnership, I think we should look to Bristol to agree to a lot of these. I'm wondering, Tom, if it would be helpful just from attorney speak perspective um, to maybe, as a sidebar, the two of y'all have a conversation, maybe have it with John and, and look at how the specifics of that work out 
and then address it with Bristol and see how we can make any adjustments that everybody finds appropriate. I'm happy to do that. That's fine. I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So right now you've got the preliminary plans and those get submitted and approved. And then you have a second stage with the final plans. And if there are changes, then those changes have to be approved by the Speedway Oversight Committee. And I don't think there's a reasonableness standard in that language. Um, let me see if I can even I, find I, it. I, I agree with Todd, though, that um, there is a provision that in the event that you're confronting cost overruns as a result of a change. Okay, so we're talking about cost overruns. <clears throat> so you have to, if you have to make changes, you're allowed to do so as long as you continue to meet the facility standard. So if, if one of your concerns, and I'm sort of reading between the lines here, is that you're going to see a, a reduction in the overall quality of the facility somehow, that's one of the places where it could creep in. <clears throat> Sherry, I'm happy as, as long as you're good delegating that. I'm happy to meet with Tom and John. Tom and I are actually talking tomorrow, but we can set the time up and run through these, these notes. Uh, Anthony and Mario, are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. Right. You're so delegated. All right. Thank you. More work. I appreciate that. Just kidding. Happy to help. Anything else in development oversight? You want to look at environmental oversight? Or do you want to take that up separately within your authority? I mean, I'll just raise this up for y'all. I mean, I don't, I don't feel super strongly about this point. I would love to hear everyone else's feedback. I heard a lot of feedback from the community about environmental mitigation, environmental standards. So again, I'm just basically saying what the community is saying here. I certainly would love for any other commissioners that feel strongly about lead standards or environmental mitigation to say so. Um, but that's sort of a separate related topic within the development agreement. Um, yeah, to I, that, go ahead. Oh, go I was ahead. gonna say, I don't feel, I feel strongly about it. I don't feel strongly, I feel also strongly that Bristol is gonna do their best. They know what to do. And I don't know, that's not a concern for me, right? I mean, that's that's part of doing their business and, and their locations all across the country. Tom, is there not a lead standard, a lead silver standard for Metro buildings anyway? There is a, it is, it is, it's, complicated to determine whether it would apply to a facility like this. Yeah. But yes, the, the, the goal for uh, Metro is lead silver at least. <clears throat> I, I, I kind of doubt there is a lead standard for racetracks. That there are buildings that are associated with this project where there probably is a lead standard. Yeah, it'd be easier for the buildings than the speedway itself. And I give a lot of credit to Bristol because I think they've agreed to either best efforts or to attempt to build to lead standards. I may have shared my cards here, guys. I don't know that that's a super strong consideration of the board. Yes, we agreed because that is Metro's policy and we agreed that it's a Metro facility and we would have the same goal. Great. Okay, well, let's move on to Fair Board and Fair Board approval. Um, CVC events must be approved by the Fair Board. Anthony. I don't have uh, just going off of what CVC does. Any event they would have over here, I think, would meet our standard. I don't know. I haven't in the past. I haven't seen anything they've done that's been something that we wouldn't want to have over here. So unless they're gonna have uh, Debbie does Dallas or. Magic, magic mic or something, but they haven't done that in the past. So, yeah, so. I, I, I mean, I would agree. I think we have, um, and we have policies, right? And I, I'm, that's not a concern for me, thinking about the CBC or the fairgrounds or Bristol wanting to do something like that. So I don't know that that's an, that's an issue, but Commissioner Hartley. I, I concur. The only thing I'll add, and, and I did want to talk about this earlier, we didn't get a chance to, um, in your answers to questions, there's this great chart that says Speedway activation chart that Laura put together, which shows essentially the current number of activations and number of people on site versus the proposed. Um, and we have in here, you know, CVC is, as part of the pro forma, the money to pay the bonds back, CVC is expecting to bring 200,000 people on site. 
And that's a lot of people. So I, I don't, I don't have any problem with CBC. I don't think they need our approval. I don't, I'm not supportive of that amendment necessarily, but I do think we should stop and evaluate, like, what are they doing that's uh, 200,000 people on site? And we might want to just ask for more information before making a determination. That's over a year, correct? That is over a year, yes. Yeah, so I mean, but that's, if you, if you average a year out over 200,000, that's not a really big number, though. They're promising 15 events to drive 45,000, 15 minor events to drive 45,000. So those are 3,000 person events. We're not really worried yeah. about those. They're averaging, they're estimating five events to drive 150,000, which is 30,000 people per event, which is, I mean, to me, that's a, that's a large event. And I don't know that we've thought about that. That, that event is equivalently large as any other concert that would be on site. I don't have any, I'm not asking for anything more than I think we could use some clarification, both because if CBC can't deliver those events, then we don't have the money to pay off the facility. And also we should evaluate the neighborhood impact of those events. And so, so that, yeah, that's what I would add, right? And, and um, echoing what Jasper said last meeting, I think with his frustration on the soccer club not being at our monthly meetings, it's just acknowledgement that we have these these larger events. And I think we should just know in general, what they're thinking about, right? And so to that point, they will be required, as all tenants will be required, to come to our monthly meetings, and there will be a special designated event um, tenant section in the um, meeting agenda that will be dedicated to hearing from whoever's on site. That would include CBC. That would include um, Bristol, obviously. It would in always include SC. Um, except for last week, for some reason. And and so, you know, Christmas Village, we'll be asking them to come. So our bigger events um, will most certainly be required to come to us. And that's that's a decision um, by the fair board and the chair. So we can move forward with that. Well, I mean, I think it's also going to be in your lease there if you, yeah. if you make them come to the fair board meeting. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. John? I think Tom can... He'll correct me, I may be wrong, but I think that the rent or the payments that CVC is making annually, that is what will be pledged towards the debt. It's not based upon how many people they actually have come here. So they're on the hook regardless, and that's the amount that's uh, pledged. So Tom, we don't need any of the FMB revenue or any of the uh, sales tax or any of the ticket tax. We do need those. So that's 200,000 people times $5 per ticket. That's a million dollars. Under the statute, I think there's, it's either 10% of the ticket price or $5. I'm not, I think it's an either or, there, there's, a, there's a max. So I, I'm not questioning you on the example, but, but I'm, I'm not, I don't wanna to commit to the math. The upshot of the thing, the answer though is, fair point, John, about the 650,000 flat payment, but there is a very large amount of revenue that drives through those. I mean, just the ticket tax might be a million plus sales tax, which is another huge bucket. So, again, I'm looking at I'm looking at this chart from Laura. We yeah, go I'll from, have to go back and I'll, look at the CSL report because I I just can't remember. So for the five large events, I'm told it's seventy five. So this is double that we're seeing here. Well, and I should talk about what I'm looking at. I asked early on in my questions to create a chart of the current impact of the facility versus the proposed impact of the facility. Laura has pr produced this for me. And it was, a, I think it was emailed to y'all today. It has the current activations on site across the whole fairgrounds, the estimated yearly attendance based on Laura's expertise. And she's got the notes out here. And then under the current deal or the new, the proposed deal, what would the number of activations be? You need to go from 205 event days a year to 229, about the same, but you go from 180,000 people on campus to 650,000 people on campus. So we might want to start by making sure Bristol agrees with these numbers. And then I would think it'd be good for us to just evaluate it because that's a lot of additional impact. And also the revenue, again, to the point about CSL, I mean, if it's, I don't know what it is, and I, I don't want to count on it if I don't know more about what it, the plans are. 
Yes, and that's why it is a draft that we're going back and just making sure, as you can imagine, it's lots of data. I do see the 75, but I think I read it, might have read it in the narratives. So we'll just make sure that we got the right numbers. Yep, I do see that. And does that flow through to the pro forma that you're using, Tom? So that should be 75,000. That's, I think that's helpful because we don't need that additional revenue, so it's less impact. So that's good. see where I got it. Yes. Okay. I see where I got it. I'm gonna so Sherry, I, I will not hijack your meeting any longer, but I might ask Laura to revise that activation chart and circulate it maybe as just a standalone so people can see it. Um, I certainly want uh, the Bristol team to look at it as well as um, the mayor's office to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. And they do have copies and that's one reason why we sent it out to make sure everything was Hence the word draft. <laughs> well, to be fair, I asked for it on December 31st, 2022. So I think I, I want to say, number one, thank you to Laura for all her work. I want to take a step back and say, I'm not criticizing Laura at all. She is my favorite person in this whole process. So I, a lot of thank you, Laura. I'm hurt. <laughs> it's not mine. You guys, you guys, Laura, then Ben, then Julie. I'm just, <laughs> okay, I guess I'll have to sleep through the night because of that. All right, insurance and local racing, the last two on the page. The insurance thing, as Tom knows, there's just a missing provision in the yeah. draft we had. I think it's probably been addressed. It's, yeah, there, well, there's a the missing provision has to do with the insurance that is required of the design builder. There's a list of, there's, there's a blank there for that that we need to add. The insurance that Bristol is required is in the lease already, but yes, we do need we de definitely do need to add that. Okay, protect local local racing in the lease agreement. You know, I've talked a lot about this, and I know we have we have Norm and, and Shane here from the local racing community, and this is important to me. Right now, in the deal, there's ten race weekends. None of them are required to be local or regional racing, which I believe again I, I operate in complete trust with Bristol that they will operate local and regional racing. But, uh, <laughs> just keeping everybody on the edge of their seat. Uh, but over a 30 year lease, I think it's important for us to hear from our constituents and the members of our community. This is important to them and it should be set aside and made a condition of the lease. The pro forma already contemplates that the revenue from local and regional racing is baked in. So I don't see why Bristol would not agree to that. It's what they're using to drive the revenue. So I just want to make it a condition because again, I think it's important that the local racing community have those weekends set aside. Also the uh, design, of the, if it goes through the design of the track and the outside, like the outside pit that the local racers want to keep I think that's very important. Uh, I don't know if you get rid of the outside pit if local racing can can be uh, maintained. Uh, I think we it would behoove us to uh, have a session with local racers just to see what their input is. I know we have, as uh, we've already stated, you have Norm. And Shane out here, who are, who are big proponents of local racing, but I think we would need to have some local racers to come before us where we're able to have some dialogue with local racers just to see, hear their thoughts. Their thoughts. I've met with a couple of them, uh, but I think as a board, uh, it would be great if we could meet with them just to hear their thoughts and, and go from there. You know, some of them may not, they may have something that we haven't thought about, or they may verify what we've been told by others. So that's what I, but I think the outside pit from what I've gathered is something that uh, was proposed in the initial <laughs> renderings, but I don't think it's in the current renderings. So uh, I think, and I want to call Bob too. I haven't talked to Bob either, get his thoughts on that as well, uh, to see how that would affect local racing if that outside pit is taken away. So, 
our conversations with Bristol have have addressed race operations. And I've really put that into their hands because they're the experts on how race days are operated and how that area can be incorporated. Because don't forget, there's a significant change within the infield itself that we don't have currently. And so what I have asked them is how can that redesigned larger capacity space accommodate what we currently do with local racing and how operationally maybe they would run racing different and how and so there's a big operational component that we're going to rely really heavily on Bristol they may tweak things do things a little bit differently um, so we've had this conversation many times about how how that would look and so we will continue those conversations be concerned um, from a local racing perspective that they're able to maneuver the cars in and maneuver the cars out and be able to have ease of access. And these guys know that. And um, that we've made no qualms about the fact. Um, do you want to speak to that? Perfect. <laughs> See? Uh, with you all's ex expertise, but have you spoken to any local racers to, and they've been on board with what you're proposing? What has been your, what has been that dialogue? Just sit right there. <laughs> <laughs> so Jerry has met with the local racers I don't know how many times, Norm probably knows, um, several times, and heard concerns. And our intention is to keep local racing and keep them happy and make them much happier. They're going to have a, such a great facility to race in. Um, we're excited about it, and I think they are too, for the most part. If there are concerns, we've tried to address them. I mean, the design is going to, we don't have the designs yet. I think once we have the designs, a lot of people are going to feel a whole lot better. Um, but yeah, it's, it's local racing is very much a part of what we're planning on continuing to do. That's out and has been about for years. So we're not looking to take that. Mario, you got anything? Anthony, what else you got? Anything? You're good? Todd? Okay, let's moving on down. Um, operational oversight. I'm on the back of the second page, or back of the first page, rather, sorry. Yeah, these look like they came from me. I mean, it's hard to say, guys, because I have a sheet that I sent to Laura that's like organized by category, and it's it's cut up, and I appreciate Laura doing it that way, but this is really more general statements that then relate to specific topics below, so sorry, it's kind of hard to follow. But I think the upshot is we're about to talk about, um, you know, noise parking traffic, number of activations, scheduling, those types of issues, site control, um, which we've heard over and over again. You guys know my, I have a, an, a position or a thought on that. Uh, the community has a thought on that. Uh, the local racing community has a thought on that. And a lot of this was just to make a general statement that I think we should try to do better to have more oversight over the externalities caused by the great number of people that Bristol is going to bring to the site. It's great that they're bringing a lot of people to the site, uh, as Ben and I were talking about earlier today, because that generates enough revenue to operate the facility. However, we must balance that against the externalities, the outside effects of those people. Um, so that's where, again, these are not specific notes. They're more related to general notes below. Anybody have anything else they want to add about this section? Any heartburn? Okay. Let's talk parking revenue. So, because I submitted most of the, I did not. 
and parking and, and receiving yeah. payment. What is, can we get some uh, clarity on that? That the fair board controls parking and receives payment? I have no idea. My assumption is that that was made clear given our last board meeting that I'm assuming during NASCAR Bristol events, they're, they're responsible for parking, parking oversight and any revenue coming in from them, right? Similar to the deal with soccer. Yeah, I, int I, I interpreted it that way because it did come in after Tuesday's meeting. So I guess that's probably meaning uh, that we receive some form of payment, not that we control parking. I mean, because if they agree to that, that'd be great. But you know what it was <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If they, but I, but I do, as we just talked about. You don't have to do the same deal you did before. Uh, we should be receiving some type of payment, you know, on parking for Bristol events. Uh, to not receive anything is short-sighted on our part. To, and to clarify, does that, I, I believe that parking was always separate and that Brist, uh, Bristol kept that all the time, but that, so that's separate from anything that's gonna roll up to pay the debt and or the fair board, correct? I mean, I'll do my best, but I'd love Laura to jump in and Tom and John. Oh, John, if you have it, you can go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to note that that was a negotiated point and factored into the the, the revenue stream and sources and measurements. And, and you know, we're, uh, Bristol's going to be paying rent. And so it, it all factors into, uh, again, it was months of negotiation. And so parking revenues for Bristol events were factored in as part of their revenue. And in the form of one of the forms of rent payment, because you've got the primary rent payment, then you've got the contingent rent. And so you have all these revenue streams that are going into the payments back to us. So essentially we're getting it in a yeah, roundabout way. Which is what I want to clarify that I don't, we are receiving, right? We are, except for major event weeks, yes. major event weeks, and yes. John it double check me, major today. event weeks, they Bristol controls it. the parking. Yeah. Otherwise for all the other events, we control the parking. So outside of the NASCAR yeah. weekend and the other two large events or three, if we give them a third week, they get parking for those those weeks. The other weeks we retain parking. I saw that. I thought that was different. I thought when, when Bristol has an event, Bristol CVC, they're controlling an event. They manage parking. There's parking presumably inside the speedway, and they would have that on all occasions. Parking elsewhere on the fairgrounds campus, they get on the on their major event weeks. Parking otherwise is the fair boards. Maybe we should have increased our ceiling on, on the last board meeting. Well, and then the same would hold true though for CVC as well, and that's spelled out as well, that if any, if any of their events were to need any space outside the least footprint, that would be a separate agreement and a separate arrangement between the CVC and the fairgrounds. I mean, we have a lot of opportunity for parking revenue is the upshot of all this. I'm still not following you all. So outside of the, outside of the main events, right? Bristol has control of them, all that revenue. Right, outside of outside of their facility, any other event is parking that anyone will want to park in the rest of the campus. We control that and we receive that revenue. There is no share unless we come to some sort of agreement specifically to that event. Is that correct? So, uh, an event that would be inside the footprint. How many parking spaces do we think that may be? I think the projection that uh, Kimberly Horn came up with 
in an improved speedway was about 1,650 spots. This is because it's about 1,100 and they projected a 50% increase, so 1,650. So inside the speedway premises, there's infield parking. Bristol always controls that because they control the entire premises. The rest of the, of the footprint, like Fair Park and any other parking under the uh, multi-use buildings, we control that every week of the year, except for the three weeks a year where they have their sort of big events. Just frankly, that's where the big events are. That's the basic split. Any more questions? Yeah. Keep going. So why couldn't we propose that even on their events that are facility only, we get some type of percentage because on their major weekends, they're getting all of the outside parking as well. So what's the difference? So to, to throw out an example, so let's just say a Beyonce concert. That wouldn't be a major event. And so they would need more than 16, they'd need more than that space. So then that would, all that parking revenue would come to us because we would have to manage it, right? So that's the, that's the agreement as I understand it, is anything outside of those major events, we would do it because of the deal with Metro, any other, anything that they're under control, which again would mean that then we would have to have our staff go into their facilities to manage parking. There's a lot of liability issues with that, that we don't want to do it, my assumption. But I see your point that what you're saying is regardless of that, any parking, there should be an additional, an additional revenue share for parking specifically. Correct. John. Again, that was a negotiated term and it depends on where the parking is. Like you said, if the parking's within the footprint of the speedway, then that's their revenue. If it is for a non-significant event week, like the Beyonce concert, and it is parking somewhere else on the property, that's the fair boards. Todd. I, I think, uh, Anthony, I'm, I'm supportive of what you're saying as far as that, that thinking. I, I think, you know, perhaps we should, you know, I think they've, they think they've turned that over. Perhaps we send that back to the mayor and the Bristol team just to further discuss it. Um, but I do think one, one additional point that I put in here and one, and, and sorry, uh, for a, is one huge benefit of this deal is that the Bristol is going to make the Speedway a, a really world-class facility. And we're going to have 1,600 parking spots in the infield. So one thing I want is for events outside of the Speedway, we should get the first right to buy out that parking. Um, I understand that Bristol may have other uses for that parking and a first right always means subject to, there's always reasonable restrictions and things like that. But when we have a soccer game, this is gonna solve a lot of soccer's traffic problems. And I really appreciate the partnership of Bristol to help us with that on the campus. So I would love to see a first right market rate rent to get those 1600 spaces when we have a soccer game or a flea market or something else on campus. And again, I, I don't think that's a huge economic burden on Bristol if they're not otherwise using those spaces, so. And it sounds similar to one of the first points that we talked about in terms of community use of the space, right? It's saying, hey, we have, we have a soccer game, we have another event, can we use that parking to be able to accommodate some of that overflow. And, and we would pay them. I mean, we're yeah, not, course, we're we not talking about yeah, free. Yeah. This would be a paid situation because yes. there'd be security, there'd be, yeah. um, you'd have to have a parking company, you'd yeah. have to have ingress and egress, all that. But I'm just saying we should get the first right before anyone else to have that parking available. Am I mistaken though, that's already contemplated in that if we were to want to use the the speedway to support our events, then we're, we're going to, be able to use that as long as it's not already obligated and that we would cover any operational costs that Bristol has to during during those events to support that use. Correct. We can't we're can you take that over to her? Go to the podium. Or go to the... <laughs> Is the idea to have it available for those events, 
that makes, I mean, that's our plan. So maybe that's the quickest way to yeah, answer so that. I guess all I'm As saying opposed is to necessarily you staffing it and you doing all of that. I mean, I think our intention is that, that we'll work something out to have, you know, have when it's available to have parking there. I mean. Yeah, I think, I think one interesting point that we should discuss on this is if a soccer game is going on, who takes that revenue and who has, right? So what we want is as a fair board to be able to have a refusal so that a deal isn't being made between Bristol and the soccer club. Well, I actually, I don't know if I, I, I hear where you're going, Mario. It's a great revenue opportunity. I think I actually agree with Julie that I'm more interested in the spaces being available. And my goal is more that they would not just lie dormant. And so as long as, and again, that's why I think it's a first and where it's a, you know, if you're, if you're using it otherwise for your own benefit, um, I just want the spaces to be available because I'm more concerned with the parking and traffic mitigation than the revenue. Again, you, what was your comment? You like, you don't deal in certainty. You like certainty. Well, I like certainty too. And what I do not like about that is that 1600 parking, right? And it's a fair market. So if that one's 25 and we're charging 30, people are going to, we're going to miss out on that parking. So that's the challenge. I can be supportive of that if that's important to you. I mean, I think, I think, we, I, I mean, I think it's important to us as a fair board in yeah, terms yeah. of if we're doing that and we're opening that up, that we should be able to make decisions on pricing and use of that space. I think regardless, what we want to do is be able to have that space open given the community impact of cars and parking. So that's why I appreciate it is like we should think through this to, to see what makes sense for all parties. And again, I think being thoughtful about that and what revenue share is going to be there is important because if we don't do it now, it won't happen later. I hear, I hear all that. I just, yeah, I mean, I hear all that. I, I think the parties are going to tell us that they've heavily negotiated the, the, the financial terms, but if it's a, it's a point of high importance, then we should, we should say that that's important to us. Certainly. So, and, and that, so to me, it, if there is an opportunity, say a soccer game, where that is not being used, right? I think we need to be thoughtful about if that is gonna be open, how does that impact the rest of parking on campus? And also, or at least match the revenue that the fair board would be getting. And so it's not, it's not as simple, but I think we just need to think through it before it happens. Currently, is it open for soccer matches? Because I never looked down there. It's... It is. It is. Okay, so going back to Commissioner Avalos' point, we don't get a red penny off of that parking. Actually, you do. So we're paying a million dollars a year plus for rent. No, I'm not saying that. Bristol. Oh, you mean I'm now? saying right now for the soccer club. No, we... Yeah, y'all are getting that, right? No. Oh. No. Nothing. Well, so then you're getting way better deal with us. <laughs> I mean, you'll get 5%, first of all, that goes into the gross revenues. You, there's any, um, and then, so they're also in the make good payments and in the rent payment, all of that was factored in into in, those calculations. So that money is going, it's just not as direct. So, I mean, I don't know what else to say. Yeah, no, and I agree. And I think this is what we're talking about. Yeah. I think the, the challenge that we're going to have is to Commissioner Hartley's point is five, 10 years down the line, that isn't as clear to the community. And so I just want to be thoughtful of what mechanisms, mechanisms we have and the, the pricing of that parking within Bristol facilities versus the rest of the campus. And so Okay. Yeah, because then mean, because you but you, for the but for a soccer game, there's there's not enough parking on campus with the speedway and the other parking anyway, right? I mean, the market's probably going to set the price, is what I'm thinking. Correct. Now we just capped our executive director on the amount of money we can make. <laughs> oh, you'll change that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm but Mario, kidding. you raise a good point, which is to some of my other points, which is this campus is, and I know Laura and Sherry are working on it, this campus is begging for sort of a 
master cooperative agreement on many of these topics. Obviously, we're not going to, we can't agree on pricing, but we can, I mean, unless Tom tells me I can, because I'm not a lawyer right now. Um, but what we can do is we need to have coordination because you don't, I think, and Julie, I think would agree, like, what we don't want is to have our consumers mad because they are confused, not even maybe price, but things like signage or direction or like ingress and egress. Those are things that need to be managed on a campus wide level. And this is sort of one outflow of that, where if we don't have coordination, then we will have, you're pointing out inconsistent pricing, but also things like, yeah, where do I drive out? Where do I drive in? Those kinds of things. So I, I like your point on that. Yeah. And, and again, I appreciate that it flows up when we have 5%, but if I'm able to charge $60 a spot in the fairgrounds property, I don't want people going into Bristol. I'd rather charge $60 on our property. You're going to charge $60 for parking? Uh, yeah, if the market's willing to pay for it. <laughs> in which case, we'll all be charging $60 to park. <laughs> I mean, our neighbors are. Yeah, we should be prepared yeah. for that because yeah. it's the market. And they, they will pay $60 plus to park walking distance from the stadium. I do it downtown for the Titans, which is why I asked that question. <laughs> I paid $67 to park at the Soho the Hospital. Preds. Yeah, Even the Preds. I will. Yeah. Okay. So Nate. again, now, ultimately, I think it's just we need coordination. So that's what it is, right? I think we're all, it's good and we, that's a, that would solve, it, not an insignificant pressure point for everyone on campus. I know it doesn't solve all of our parking issues, but 1,600 spaces are a lot. And I think it, it could, once we think about everything else that's going on on campus, we just do have to think about, you know, are people managing parking versus Bristol versus soccer? Uh, that's a lot of coordination that we just have to be thoughtful about. Laura, could you actually, we were talking before this meeting, can you go over the uh, fully developed campus, the, the parking facilities on campus? Because I think this is important information what will be available for a Speedway event and a non-Speedway event. So if I understand what is available currently, sure. So if we start at lot one, that is the lot that is immediately adjacent to the expo buildings closest to Nolansville. Lot two right now is storage, but that is the open space between the expo buildings and 50 forward. Um, lot three is actually 54 and sometimes we use it because they are a tenant um, on our property and I know soccer has an agreement with them to use 54 word. Lot four is the grassy area on Bransford that is part of phase two development. It's where the open air pavilion, it's the small grassy area between the main dog park and the uh, gate nine that we came into this building. Lot five is the large fair park area. Lot six is the small fair park area. Lot seven is the Craighead lot. Lot eight is the speedway. Lot nine is this back lot that we parked in to come here. Lot 10 is the lot that is immediately to the north um, east of the soccer stadium. Lot 11 is the flat lot across from the expo buildings off of Wedgwood. And lot 12 is going to be the um, parking structure where 8C is between the speedway and the stadium. And I think you ballparked all that for me earlier as right. 4,000 4, ish spots yes. in the best case. Yes, because they're shared. Including, including the 1600 in the speedway. Correct. So, I'm only stopping here, guys, so that we know. And again, I think it's an important, I'm not saying this is not a reason to move forward, but we should have eyes open that we are moving 600,000-ish people through the facility with 4,000 spaces on a good day and 2,500 spaces on a bad day. That is something that's manageable potentially, but we should at least be mindful of that fact. That's not for these amendments today. That's for another day for us to think about, but because I think they've already negotiated all that, but I think we should be mindful of that. Anybody have any other comments about that? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to penalties. So I'll say, I, 
I, I, I like the general idea, and we heard from the public the idea of a financial penalty. I also discussed that with Jerry, and Jerry was generally open to the idea of a penalty because he believes in the sound mitigation that the team's going to put in. I did not propose the $100,000 number. Um, I would be supportive of the parties working for a penalty that's uh, a sting, but is doable for Bristol. And what is a penalty for sound mitigation? Like how far over does it have to be? Without getting in the weeds. Yeah, just um, give a round, just give a round. I'm going, I am going to be um, as concise as I can. When, one of the things that I asked was that we have a range, we have a target benchmark number, but there be a range around that number because you have to be mindful of weather, wind, ambient noise. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Right, okay. So when you think in terms of the range, it's gonna, according to Jack Wrightson, who's the acoustician, it's from minus three decibels. And if it goes down, that's a good, good thing, right? If it's Correct. low, we're, we're all good. But when you build in the decibel standard, according to the International Standard Organization, there is an inherent three decibel pop that occurs, so instead of your baseline being a zero, it's three. So when you when you put that range on paper, it's minus three to five or six, because that builds in that three dB bump because it's logarithmic. And so that is one of the things that's gonna be addressed in the act. Don't go to sleep, John. Um, <laughs> that's gonna be one of the things that's, that's addressed when we talk about um, application of, of the enforcement measure and the accountability. Um, we talked about the fact that you can't take a, a three millisecond um, muffler noise and apply a penalty because, and the example I used before was if you have an accident and somebody's muffler gets blown off, you need to give them time to get that vehicle, number one, the driver out safely and then shut the thing off. And so um, one of the things that we're going to address in the sound mitigation is a an average, oh, and it's called an LEQ average. So you take average numbers throughout a 30 minute period, and then you average those. And if that LEQ is higher than the 60 B number, then we have a series of penalties that are in. So a first violation is gonna be, well, you better fix the thing. Investigate it, figure it out, and fix it. And you have this timeline to do it in. If there's a second violation, then there's another set of standards and we're gonna make sure there's some level of financial penalty. If there's a third violation, there's another level of financial penalty, each one harsher and harsher. We are working out those final numbers. That's it in a nutshell. Um, another piece of it, and I'm gonna go ahead and share this piece, um, that we're looking at is instead of defining what a race car is, it's a vehicle. That's a catch-all. A vehicle's a vehicle's a vehicle. Um, vehicles that are developed with mufflers inherently. Vehicles that are combustion engine. I mean, if you start picking apart every kind of vehicle, then you're gonna get in the weeds and you're gonna get in trouble and there will be a loophole. If you just specify vehicle with the caveat that we presented, I think it'll it'll be helpful. John, do you want to add anything to that? Or Julie? No, that was a, a very good summary of the discussion that we had. Um, and I, I understood it better this time than I did the other. <laughs> when, yeah, when, when you start talking drawing, logarithms, uh, I'm out. But I, I was actually, drawing pictures yesterday. I, I, I did under, <laughs> yes, thank you. Tom, was that better? <laughs> uh, it was. It was better. Uh, I know y'all are actively negotiating on both sound mitigation and the, and the scheduling piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of this next whole page related to penalties, race scheduling, and sound mitigation. I almost feel like it'd be better for us to not go through that and yes. wait until you get because the yes. parties have spent a lot of additional time negotiating that. And we would be better served just waiting to get those documents and then coming at it fresh. Well, and I was going to share as we went down this, um, a lot of this is already covered. 
a lot of this has already been addressed. And um, I think the sound mitigation, for example, that we've got, the plan that we're putting together, um, it's pretty comprehensive. And and I think it, it covers all bases. I do have a question, Tom um, and John. Can we, one of the things that they've asked for in penalties is to the Nashville chapter of Speedway Children's Charities. Can we do that? I don't think we can authorize that, can I don't, we? I don't think you can either. Is that supposed to mean you take money from the charity <laughs> or you give the money to the charity? I'm supportive of the second, Matthew, but not the first. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we can. Yeah, we can't require that. Do you want to explain why? If it is a, a penalty built in a contract, then the first of all, there are issues with penalties anyway, and we've got to be careful with that and make sure that is appropriate given the, the circumstances. And then directing, now, the fair board, if it wanted to theoretically make a grant to a nonprofit from penalty money, then they could probably do that. They would probably have to have it appropriated by the council as a grant. Um, I mean, that's theoretically possible, but just a straight going to the nonprofit, I think that would be problematic. Anybody else have anything? If there's nothing else, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Did I miss it? Well, you know what? The details of having to look at the next page. Well, and I did want to ask, Sherry, within the yeah. discussion of noise, mm -hmm. have you guys discussed, uh, are you, I mean, if you're, just say yes, if you are, you guys are discussing muffler usage and, and trying to get some type of agreement on that. Okay, yes, thank you. When you think about sound mitigation, it's multifaceted. Yeah. So we're addressing all of the factors that can be addressed as they as they relate to um, attenuation. For the upcoming season, uh, do we track the sound for these races upcoming? Yes, Track Enterprises monitors sound. Anybody else have anything, Mario? Okay, so let's go to term language. I mean, this is this is this is for me. Uh, this is a fairly um, this is just a technical point for the lawyers. To me, I understand you're 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 basically trying to say we are a government entity, but we're acting like a like a commercial business. I'm cool with that as long as it's not. Again, back to my initial point about there's some places where we need more discretion, and in those those cases, I would just add that unless it's otherwise covered. Also, I know Bristol would already be held to that standard, but I'd like them included here. I hope that's not super controversial, but if it is, please let me know. You can handle that offline when you handle your other authorized duties. Termination. So this one is really important, guys. I, I really want us to focus on this for a second. I mean, we've already talked about it, but the idea is we, one of my big things is campus control. Like we're worried, we've got a lot of tenants, we've got a lot of uses on campus. We have charter protected uses that we have to do. We have to do these things. We have to do local racing. We have to do a flea market. We have to do a fair. We have to do those things. We have to make rules for the campus. Right now, and I, and I hope everybody understands this issue, right now, if we make a rule that material impacts, materially impacts Bristol's ability to operate their business, they have a termination right. I will not vote for this deal if that is in there. It is it is not appropriate. So uh, that's really, really important. Everybody should really focus in on that. We need the ability, again, within reason, within not what's going to contravene the lease. Obviously, we cannot contravene the lease with a rule because we are required to follow. Uh, well, I mean, Tommy, tell me if he disagrees. I don't believe we can contravene the lease with a fair board rule, but I would not expect Bridstall to follow a rule that's in contravention of the lease. Other than that, I think we should be able to make campus rules. Again, this was a uh, this particular language was very heavily negotiated, um, and both parties moved quite a bit. Um, yes, we we agree that um, 
you know, the fair board should be able to have reasonable rules and, and, and no, they shouldn't contravene the lease. I think what we're, this is a 30 year agreement. So we're trying to think, okay, in 2040, what does the fair board look like? And is it possible that the fair board could adopt some kind of rule that made it impossible or the, the council could enact some kind of law that made it impossible to operate a race? That's what we're trying to prevent for. Again, it's extremely unlikely, but because it is a 30 year lease, we're just trying to think of, you know, make sure that, that we're addressing those issues. Julie. This is pretty standard is my understanding. It's, it's in the Titans lease, it's in Bridgestone. Maybe I'm wrong about some of those, but it's my understanding that's fairly standard. It's important to us that we be able to operate our business. And you know, while everybody around this table is great, wonderful and reasonable, we don't know what this board's gonna look like in 2040 or 50 or whatever that is. And we need to be protected against somebody coming in and a million little ways keeping us from being able to operate our business. And this is not a provision any of us would ever want to invoke. I mean, there's, I don't know if there's an instance in the country where one's ever been invoked, but it's a protection I think that we all need. John, you said this was heavily negotiated. Could you tell me where you guys started compared to the language that you have now? It was basically, well, I mean, I'm not gonna re rehash negotiations publicly, but I think Tom and Julie will both say that this provision was negotiated. The only thing I'll add, and then I'll let you go, Tom, is, um, we have a fiduciary duty to the overall campus. We have multiple campus tenants. My number one concern with this deal right now is that we're overbuilding the site and that we will not have enough room for everyone on site. I expect that there will be rules that we put in place that Bristol will not like, and I believe this gives them an, a termination right. I think we should strongly consider asking the parties to go back to the drawing board and find a better position for Metro. Is there a similar uh, termination clause in the deal with soccer? I, I don't believe there is, no. There's, there probably is a provision that says, uh, you know, if there is a, if, if Metro or the state adopts a, a, some sort of a law that affects the, affects their ability to perform, um, that they, they can renegotiate. I don't, I don't recall a termination provision. For It'd that. be helpful to get that if we can. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, you got a battery. That's all I get. Yeah. Time to go. Oh, come on, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> We're here now. We're here now. I'm thinking yeah, back. Ah, uh, sorry, sucker. <laughs> that's mic off. Uh, Tom, I think that's a really good point. I believe, I agree with you, and to Julie, to your point, I believe it is very common when contracting with government entities, if a law is passed that is contravene, that contravenes the lease, that number one, you should have an opportunity to renegotiate because the, the government entity can't limit their own authority. So in a, in a general sense, you wouldn't be able to do that because you, you can't pass a law that makes it not able to contract. But here, that's not what this says. This just says, it doesn't say renegotiate. It says, and we're not, you know, I, I just, I think that's apples and oranges to me. So I think, uh, Maria, you have a really good point, which is let's look at what um, are in some other uh, documents. Perhaps Tom can in confidence get us examples from other sports authority deals to look at. And the clause also, the termination is 30 days notice? Yeah, that's what it says. It's 10D yeah. in the lease. I mean, I give my tenants, they have to give me more than 30 days for a home or an apartment. I just, I really, that's one of my challenges with this termination clause is, while it might not happen, is this is, a 30 year deal on a racing facility, Bristol leaves, then we are sitting on a open air 30,000 seat racing facility. I mean, I think that's great. I mean, there's not even like, and, and I, again, I hear you, John, that you don't wanna talk about where you negotiated, but there's a 30 year out, there's no cure period. You could do 180 days. There's a lot of things you could do that there's additional room for negotiation. And again, you tell me if you disagree, we'd love an opinion on Metro Legal. I mean, we can contravene our own authority, unlike Metro Council. So, I mean, again, I, 
Yeah, I just, I just, I just, I don't believe this is market, Julia. I may just disagree with you about that. We are happy to have further discussions about this topic. I mean, I can't agree to anything right now. I, I haven't talked to my client. Totally. We're just doing, this is all just us talking and y'all are just here informing us. So. Okay. Seeing no other comments, we'll move on. Uh, TMP. Sorry, that means transportation management plan. <laughs> I mean, it looks like probably one of these is mine. Probably, I mean, I'm guessing maybe the other one's from Jasper or someone else. But my, the upshot here is I, I totally hear Russell on, and I've talked to Jerry at length about prep, preparing a parking management plan ahead of time is not feasible. So what I suggested as an alternative here is we should get oversight uh, of Bristol's parking and management plan. And if it's not sufficient, we should get the ability to, for example, require them to make changes to it, to again, worry about those externalities in the deal. So let me ask a question um, of Bristol. You run a lot of different facilities. Um, on average, how many people are you moving? How many cars are you moving? And how far in advance do you typically facilitate your traffic plan for your sites? And I'm just talking generalities. Well, I mean, we've got, I mean, Speedway Motorsports, our parent company has, you know, lots of racetracks um, all over the country. At Bristol specifically, which is the thing I can speak to most directly, you know, we always make sure that the neighbors know. I mean, it's, first of all, we've been running NASCAR events there long enough that most people know how the traffic's going to flow. But we have detailed plans that are done well in advance with the city and published in advance. Anyone can you know, know which direction they're going in and out. We put on the parking passes, this is how you're going to exit for the people who are on our property. You know, we have maps on our website, go look at it now. You know, we have, you know, and it depends on the event. So if we have a concert at the dragway, we have a different parking and traffic plan for that. We have a different plan if we're doing something smaller at the speedway. We publish those in advance. We want our fans to know. I mean, a bad parking experience is a bad experience. I mean, it doesn't matter how good the race was. If people can't get in and out, they're not happy. And um, so we're in the business of trying to make sure that their first and last part of the experience when they're coming into the parking lots and going out is a good one. So it is, you know, we want everybody to have a smooth, easy plan. Now that said, there are other users of this property that have events as well. And we need to coordinate so that the neighbors know what to expect. They know if, if this road's going to be closed off, it's going to be closed off every time for a large event. I mean, we're really only talking large events here. Um, smaller events, if there's, you know, several thousand spaces here, we, we're fine. But it's, it's not going to be um, something that we just you know, say, hey, good luck, guys. I mean, it's just, it, it, that's not how we operate. We can't do things that way. It doesn't work. People don't come back if you do that. John. And going back to our last point, if we presented a plan and the fair board said, no, we want you to park every vehicle that's going to come here on site, well, that makes it impossible to hold a race. So, I mean, there. yes, we think that having oversight and and having communication regarding the parking plan is definitely needed and we're open to additional language to try and um, clarify that anthony um i guess commissioner hartley when you said communicated to the public if that's the one you did how, what what mechanism of communication are you referring to uh, that is not. That's not yours. I did not propose that one. I proposed the you other one. You proposed the second one. Would yeah. Pay a monetary penalty. Uh, I don't remember one? putting yeah. that, yeah, but I, I, think I think I did put that. <laughs> I I don't feel as strongly about the monetary penalty okay, there. All right, all right. I probably wrote that like at two in okay, the morning. All right, so gotcha. apologies. All right, so that's on. I'm just figuring out on our website, their website. What is a form of communication? What what means are we talking about? You know, 14 days before the event. And then jumping to the next one, uh, where it says 
if the parking plan is deficient, then we have them, we have them revise it. I mean, uh, just how would we know the parking plan was deficient? How would you, how would, how would we determine if the parking plan is efficient or not? I think, Anthony, you hit a really good point, which is, and Ben and I talked about this earlier today, I think this is a really great opportunity to revitalize the fairgrounds speedway. However, we just have to keep clear-eyed that we're talking about, in the best case for a speedway event, we have 2,500 parking spots on campus for potentially 30,000 person event as well as 220 activation days per year. So I don't have the answers to all of the questions about how to mitigate these externalities. My point is that we should consider that there are significant, and we've heard months of the community talk about externalities. Like you can agree or not agree, but they feel that is a concern. So I don't have all the answers to those things, but what I'm, my approach here was perhaps additional oversight will mitigate some of those externalities. I am open to other ideas, but that is how I'm approaching it. Yeah, I, I understand that. I'm just saying I don't, you know, and I go to plenty of sport events. I'm a you know, former athlete, former coach. Yeah. So I'm just like if someone put a plan in front of me, couldn't tell you if it was a good one or if it was a bad one, you know, because yeah. it's, you just have to go out there and, you know, experience what it is. And then you see, now once you experience it, you can come back and say, hey, maybe next time we should have this road closed and we should open this road or we should have. So I think that's just got, that's going to be give and take once you get into the throes of this going. Now, I don't know what soccer is doing. I'll find out in two weeks when I go to the match, but, you know, we'll see. Well, and I guess that's exactly what I'm getting at, Anthony. When, you know, again, at our last meeting when soccer didn't, come present anything on their upcoming season and we don't know that, I think what I'm looking for when I'm talking about approval is that exact back and forth where we did this, come and tell us what worked, what didn't work and what you're going to do to improve it. It keeps everybody accountable and in the process. And quite frankly, I think that speaks to the requirement that we're going to put in there that you come to the fair board and that you come to the fair board on a routine basis. And that'll be one of the expectations is that we, we are presented with here it is on the website and here's the plan if it's this many people and here's the plan if it's this many people and we have the opportunity well in advance to have that conversation and which we do now um laura goes to whoever it is for example soccer and says look you've got this coming up on this date and we need you here by x date in order to make sure that you have yourself covered um I, I'm like Anthony. I have no idea what an appropriate transportation plan is until well, I actually live it. Right. Well, and I think I think everyone would agree with that. And I think just like a thought experiment is like, you know, we all we all got a lot of calls and a lot of emails when soccer had a, they did their best. I'm not we're not going to bag on soccer, but like when they had problems with their traffic and parking plan. Um, wouldn't it have been great if we had an enforcement mechanism to have them come and explain in detail how they plan to change it? Because what I heard is that during the season, their level of communication to fans fell off. Well, if we have an oversight mechanism, then we can ensure that that continues to be high quality. So exactly what you're saying, I'm saying bring them back. That's all I'm asking is that we have oversight. And again, everybody thinks we're going to be good partners. And I agree. I, I expect these guys to bring a world-class parking and traffic plan. I just want to have oversight to make sure it works. I mean, again, this is a government facility. It's in the public's interest. We should, um, we should make sure we maintain sufficient oversight. Which so, is why they'll show up. Yeah, so just a general continuous working on the parking plan sure. as opposed to saying a deficient plan must be revised. But if we can do a continuous working on it, I can see what you're saying. I can be in that. Yeah. And it's in Bristol's interest to revise it if it needs to be revised. So, yeah, yes. all of our interests, right? Because mm -hmm. to the previous conversation about revenue, it's in all our interests, right? What was it, Mr. Treese? <laughs> <laughs> okay, use of fairgrounds. Remove provision allowing the fair board to agree. Yeah, I mean, 
it sounds like crazy against our own interests, guys. But what I'm doing here is I'm trying to say like, if this deal is not successful and there's revenue pressure, we will feel the potential to expand the amount of large events on site. I would rather protect us from having to make that decision and make the deal what the deal is. The deal is three weeks. Let's make it three weeks. Let's not give ourselves the opportunity. We can always amend the contract if you want to amend the contract. But to me, I just don't want to have to make that decision later. I'd rather just have the deal be the deal. Let's, let's have it be three and not have the, feel that revenue pressure driving us to give more and, and have to rediscuss all these meetings over and again. Tom, you want to address that? It's, we can certainly take that out if it's up, if it's okay with Bristol. I mean, I, I understand your, your concern, but as you say, we could always amend the lease to put it back in or to uh, give the fair board further options to tinker with the, with the schedule. So, um, but I, I think, I think your point is that you would prefer that the board not have the discretion to approve that, which they might exercise as a result of revenue pressure. That is a good characterization. Yeah. Happy to, happy to discuss that. So just to clarify in the significant event weeks, the fourth week currently is within the premises. The fourth week they have control of just the speedway. Of of the lease premises. They can, they can, they can request more. Right. But if we request more, presumably we would pay for that use, which we can arguably do pretty much for any event in the contract. So then we don't need it. So why take it out? I think that what I'm looking at is I'm trying to balance this as a deal that's relatively neutral on the amount of racing in the community. And it's hard for us to have, a, it's, it's hard to, to say it's three and it could be four later. So it's better for us just to make it what it is. That's my point. This is not like the number one consideration in my mind. If you guys are like, just think I'm crazy and doesn't make any sense or nobody was, it's at the end of the chart for a reason, right, Sherry? <laughs> so that's, that's, I've set my piece on it. No, you guys can I, discuss it. Yeah. Well, so it's alphabetical. for our upcoming season, because Brussels not here uh, yet, if and when, how many uh, race events the schedules are currently in what's coming up. Is that it right there? Oh, yes, the current activations, it's almost equal. So it's like 19, eight, 19 currently and 20 or 21, depending on what year it is. So it's it's remarkably similar, except for the track practices have reduced by five. And she's saying days from last year, 19 days, now this year, 21 days. Okay, so, so very similar. And this is all local. How much, how, many, how much is local? No, right now we have a mix. So we do local racing up to what we, I guess, refer to as regional racing. So is that, you have to on that? It's not split up by that. It, it's not split here, but it's very similar except for the NASCAR weekend, which is different. And there's different there's different combinations of weekends under their proposal that is really kind of hard to um, to communicate on paper because depending on if you have a cup race or not, it may some of the other races may couple with a regional race that we have currently because we will run both local and regional on the same weekend. Mm-hmm. And their proposal is very similar. So would it help Hang on. Would it help if we gave it to you in days? Yeah, so what's basically what I'm just trying to get at is right now we're all just local and regional with the exception of is the is the All American four hundred, what is that considered? I mean, we've considered it a regional race. Mm-hmm. Okay. But there, a lot of those, there's local components within there. Okay. And I know Bob has, you know, done his best to keep those numbers up. All right. So if Bristol's here, would all of those stay or would some of those go away? That's a race operation question. <laughs> I'm trying to get at, we keep saying 10 race events, but 
to me, that number may need to be higher if you're looking at what we currently have now. Because if we're talking about, if we're talking about protecting local racing, it's fine and dandy that Bristol comes in, but if Bristol brings, they, whatever they bring in knocks out, say five of these events, then we're not really protecting local racing. So that's back to, I, so the way the, the way the revenue is dri driven and, and you guys double check me, you've got a NASCAR race, a couple of larger races, and then about seven weekends that are local and regional racing. That's how, that's the plan that Bristol has. And that's how the money is expected to run in the deal. I've asked to your point that we put on paper that those seven local and regional race weekends be explicitly set aside for these guys so that you can't, for example, bring in, and I know you, this is not feasible, so don't make fun of my hypothetical, but you couldn't bring in 10 NASCAR races and then crowd them out. Uh, you can't bring in 10 NASCAR races for a lot of reasons, but that would be, it would just be clear in the, in the deal that they can't, for example, uh, substitute other types of races uh, in lieu of the uh, local and regional racing. That's my proposal. These guys haven't agreed to it. I think they're debating it now, but that's what I'm proposing. Protect local racing and also if and when Bristol happens, their ability to do what they have to do, I just say if when y'all negotiating again, if you could bump it up a little bit. We'd That's be okay with adding those <laughs> Well, my point, Anthony, is like in there's enough money in the deal to set those seven weekends aside. They don't have to do it. NASCAR doesn't have to do anything else to make enough money in the deal. They've already said this is what they're going to do. And that's how we're going to decide how much money we borrow. So I don't even think we have to bump it up to be worried about enough money. Anything else? Use of fairgrounds, we are done. Do I hear a motion to adjourn this? So the schedule is next, we're going to do public hearing Monday, and then the parties are continuing to negotiate, I guess. The other work session on the 23rd. Okay. And what's, what's Tuesday? Monday, nothing Tuesday. We have a public hearing at 50 forward at 6 p.m. That's on Monday. Monday. Nothing Tuesday. Good. I didn't know if you have the scheduling declaration and noise stuff done by next Thursday, I will be here. If you don't have it done, I'm going to go to my son's basketball game. And with apologies to everyone, it's his last game. I want to come if it's important, but if we're still looking at this information, I would rather hold off. Is that okay with you, Cher? <laughs> Cher Wiener? Did you call me Cher? Cher, Cher Wiener, <laughs> Cher Wiener, all mixed together. We're adjourned. Thank you. Sorry. I just want to make sure that John and I know what our marching orders are. Yes. You know, I know I'm working on the sound protocol and hope to be able to circulate a draft internally into the Bristol folks. It, I got a meeting with Todd tomorrow, and it sounds as if Todd and John and I are going to be talking about some of these specific issues. Then we're going to discuss them further at, a, at another work session. Is that the plan? Yeah, we'll talk offline. Okay. Make sure we are going to do what you want. You're good. You're good. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.